Hope everybody's doing well today. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast. And we have someone special calling in from California. She is a triathlon coach. Uh, she was a triathlete. She is a uh, leukemia survivor. And she has a lot to talk about. And I want to welcome Siri Lindley to the Unimpressed Podcast. How are you doing, Siri? I'm doing great. Thank you, John. It's great to be here with you. So I see this book here and I see Tony Robbins name on the book. Tell me a little bit about that to start. Uh, well, Tony Robbins has been my greatest mentor since I was about 20 years old. Um, he didn't know it. I didn't know him personally, but he uh, guided me through some really dark times through his books, through his teachings. And I, my story at the age of 23, I wanted to become the best in the world in triathlon, but I didn't know how to swim. So it was kind of this impossible dream that um, everybody kind of laughed at me for having it. But I had a deep emotional reason why I had to do whatever I could to try and make this happen and taught myself how to swim, got a coach. And eight years later, was able to become the world champion, number one triathlete in the world. And it was basically my impossible dream coming true. And there's a huge story to that. But basically in 2016, Tony Robbins reached out and said, we'd love to have you on, our, on my podcast. And I said, oh, you must be at this point, I'm coaching athletes. And I've coached athletes to Olympic medals and world championship crowns. And I thought, oh, okay, which athlete do you want on your podcast? And he said, no, I want you. So I got on the Tony Robbins Robbins podcast and somehow, some way that episode became his most downloaded episode. Over 3 million people downloaded the episode. And we met shortly after in person at one of his events and just became, you know, fast friends. We just, uh, so much in common and he had helped me so much. And I ended up becoming a keynote speaker at, at all his events, Unleash the Power Within, Date with Destiny. So it's been just the ultimate blessing and privilege to be able to serve on his mission. He is such an extraordinary man doing amazing things in the world. And um, But there's a long story. It, uh, it's not that easy the way it sounds that everything yeah. just went great. Um, well, I, wanted, I wanted to start there. I mean, you know, be, you said you're from Connecticut and you're in your 20s, you know, high school. So in high school, you didn't know how to swim? Oh, no, I didn't know how to swim until I was 23 years old. That's when I, um, I was a three sport athlete in high school and college. I played field hockey, ice hockey and lacrosse. And um, after college, I just graduated and I had found out I was gay, which was a shock to me and a shock to my family and my father, who was my I apologize for my dog barking. Uh, my father, who is my hero, my best friend, uh, found out that I was gay. And he basically cut me out of his life when he found that out. He couldn't handle it. And that was devastating to me. You know, it made me feel like everything that I was meant absolutely nothing now that I was gay. And because of that, when I saw a triathlon, which is swimming, biking, and running, and I saw all these people of all ages and sizes and abilities, and I thought, oh my God, maybe this is a way that I can find a respect for myself, an appreciation for myself, a love for myself somehow. And I did my first race and obviously didn't know how to swim. I came in dead last. I humiliated myself, ran with my helmet on and did all sorts of ridiculous things. But it's when I crossed the line in last place that I decided inside myself that one day I was going to become the best in the world in this sport. I had to, you know, I was like on this desperate mission to prove to myself that even as a gay woman, you know, I could achieve something that I thought was special that I could inspire others, that I could make a difference in this world, that I could be loved. And it was going to be through triathlon and, and doing everything in my power to become proficient at it and hopefully get closer to this dream of becoming the best that I would find those things. And um, it was a long road. I failed over and over and over again. But with every failure, I learned a lot and I grew a lot. And after eight years of just, you know, training like a world champion, even though I suck for the first few years, after eight years, my impossible dream came true. And um, but it required a lot. It required absolute dedication. It required me training six to eight hours a day of, you know, intense, um, outrageous training. It took failing and giving failure a new definition that failure is learning. And I found my way there. And, you know, the stories of in this book, of my new book, 
um, finding a way, taking the impossible and making it possible is all about how I'm, I'm no different to you or anyone listening today. It's just that I found a way to, you know, live the story in life that I wanted to live. We can all do that. I went from living a life that was so hard, I didn't want to live anymore, but deciding that that's not the story I want to live. So, you know, we all get to go first in deciding what story in life we want to live. And in order to do that, we need to go first in deciding what we want to focus on. Do we want to focus on all the reasons why we can't or all the reasons why we can? Do we want to focus on everything that's missing, everything that we don't have, or do we want to focus on everything we have and, and everything that's right? And most importantly, do we want to focus on everything we have no control over, which is other people, what they think, what they do, or do we want to focus on what we have all the control over, which is our own experience of life in every single moment? What meaning will you give the things that are happening? What do you tell yourself is possible for you? It's up to you. And when you, you said you discovered you were gay. Right. I mean, I'm a firm believer. You are who you are. You can't you can't help what you're made of. Um, how did you did you question that uh, through high school and your teens and, and up to your 20s? Because, I mean, I think that speaks to a little bit of what's going on now. I think it's it's self understanding self and who you mm -hmm. are and, and not being shy about that. What was that thought process? You know, because that's an interesting dynamic. Yeah, it was not in high school, but it was in college. And I had reached a really low point in my life. I had extreme anxiety and deep depression. And it was because I was locked in thoughts of everything that was missing, everything I didn't want to have happen, everything I had no control over. It was no wonder. On the outside, it looked like everything's great. You know, I'm going to an Ivy League university. I'm playing three varsity sports. But on the inside, I was just, I was slowly dying. I had insane OCD where I'm flicking lights on and off for hours at a time until I could wipe some horrible thought out of my mind. And I was exhausted. And um, that's when Tony came into my life because I was ready to just call it a day, <laughs> call it a life. But I came across Tony's first book, Unlimited Power, and it changed my life because I realized that this, this is up to me. Like this darkness, this depression is caused by my focus and the meaning I'm giving this life and everything that I'm doing about it. So when I finally woke up to the fact that, you know, I'm the conductor of my own symphony of life, it's up to me to make it a good life versus a tragedy. It opened me up to the present moment. Who am I? I didn't, I was so locked up in my fears and anxiety. I didn't even know who I was. And it was then that I really started, um, discovering that this was who I am. And, you know, there, there's a story that we tell ourselves, right? And when my dad hung up the phone and didn't talk to me for two years, the story he was telling me is that because of who I am, I'm worthless. And because of who I am, I'm unlovable and I'll never be happy or find success. But I wasn't willing to live that story. So mm -hmm. I had to tell myself the story that if I am all of who I am, that's where I can create the life I dream of. That's where I can tap into my fullest potential. Now, I didn't believe it in that moment. I've just been dumped by the person that I love more than anything in the world. But I had to become that person that believed that when I live fearlessly authentic, I can truly bring to the world the best of me. And triathlon was a vehicle through which I would find a way to do just that. Do you think your 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 family pressures and this exterior pressures when you're in a collegiate setting. Do you think that just made you just keep how you felt in, internal? You just internalized how you felt, and you just Absolutely. because of those pressures. Absolutely. And at the time, you know, I found my worthiness from being a great athlete, achieving, you know, getting good grades, being a people pleaser, you know, being everything that I thought I needed to be for everyone else around me, and that got me in a lot of trouble because that led me into a deep, dark depression. And so in a sense, there was great loss with me discovering who I really was, but there was also this beautiful freedom in deciding to live life for me and not for everyone else. And there's a happy ending to this. You know, my father, um, I don't know. I want you all to think about someone that's hurt you in, in your life. And what I realized about 20 years later is that I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for my father, if it wasn't for what happened back then when I was 23 years old. You know, his rejection gave birth inside of me to this insatiable hunger 
you know, this determination, this drive, this, this desire to want to achieve something that seemed impossible so that I could find a worthiness from within. So, and what I realized too, that I forget about, and I want you to think about that person that hurt you, who wouldn't you be today if it wasn't for that person? And what happened? What are your strongest traits? Were those traits born in that experience or born from that pain? And what I realized years later is that in forgiveness, we become free. And, you know, if we're going to blame the people that have hurt us for all the bad in our lives, we also need to blame them for the good. And we have to look at, you know, there were times after two years when he started trying to call me, but I was so angry. I would just unleash all my anger, all my pain on him. Eventually he stopped calling. You wouldn't want to keep calling me, would you, John? If every time you called me, I just like rip your head off. So it was just about, you know, eight years ago when I realized that he was exactly the father I needed him to be to become the woman that I'm really proud to be today. And so I called him and I I told him how much he had hurt me, but also that I forgive him and that I actually want to thank him because I'm proud of who I am today. And he started crying. He said how sorry he was. He said he'd been following my entire career and how proud he was of me. And I had my father back, but forgiveness was a key. Now for all of us, like sometimes you forgive someone and they may, you may not want them in your life and that's fine. But the thing is that when we forgive, we become free. We become free of the excuses because when we blame someone for all the pain in our life, you know, it becomes an excuse like, well, this is why I've never had a great relationship or this is why I haven't achieved the success I've dreamed of achieving. And it leaves us powerless, right? But when we forgive and find compassion in some way, or at least look for the gift in what happened, we become free. And that is something that if you haven't experienced it yet, I want you to think about doing it with the person that has hurt you and think about how you become free to truly find joy again and be all that you dream of being because you have removed the shackles of pain and disempowerment that is blame. Forgiveness is for you. I think I say this every show because I think there's a lineage your pattern in society. I always say this is when we're born, you know, our subconscious is being programmed. And then when we get to a, a, a certain point, we start responding with our unconscious bias through that programming. And if you if you think about that, that's why a lot of people never can find consciousness. But I think the key to uh, forgiving is you have to find yourself because if if you're born into this pattern of life where you think you have to search, you're looking for this, you're looking for that, you find this, you find that, you find that. And, and through this process, and while people can never reach consciousness, a lot of people can never reach consciousness because they lose themselves within that process. So once you get just like you said, you, as you got older, you were angry and, and so forth. And because of that pattern and that process, you start uh, taking that anger out on the people around you because that's kind of the tradition. The traditional model. But I don't think a lot of people find themselves where they're able to forgive. You know, and I think that's very, very important because I think you have to understand that. We have to we have to start somehow start educating this process at an earlier age. And I think you would find out that there wouldn't be as many people lost as there are today because of that. I mean, it, it speaks to, you know, it speaks to pretty much 90% of the population and how they live their lives? You're absolutely right, John. And and this is one of my purposes in writing this book is to, you know, I've gone back and looked at my life and tried to figure out, like, how did I find a way through these things? How did I find a way to forgiveness? How did I find a way to knowing who I am and living my story, not someone else's story for me? And it's a guide for people to go and find their own way by, by being able to uncover, like you're talking about the programming, you know, so often people become who they were told they were from their parents or their teachers. And suddenly they wake up one day thinking, why do I feel so unfulfilled? Why do I feel so unhappy? And they realize that the life they've been living is the one that their parents wanted them to live, but not the one they wanted to live. But it takes kind of doing a deep dive into yourself and into your own life to truly discover like, what do I want? What matters most to me? And how can I decide today to live the life that I want to live versus the one I've been living? Where do you get that? 
passion from? Because I can tell, like, you can go from zero to a hundred very quick. <laughs> so where do you, where do you, <laughs> where do you get that passion from? You know, because I'm a clairsentient, so a lot of times, like, I can see things times fifteen, and I don't know if you're like that or similar, but I get kind of that same vibe from you in a way. Yes. A highly, highly sensitive person. Yes. Um, go zero to a hundred very quickly. Uh, may not think about some stuff when you get to a hundred in between zero and a hundred. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And you know what this passion, well, number one, I just feel so blessed to be alive today. You know, three years ago, I was given a diagnosis with acute myeloid leukemia where I had less than 5% chance of surviving. And that's scary. And, and that disease brought me to my knees, but I had made a decision in the beginning that this was not my time to go. Like I had finally, after 49 years of life, found my freedom. And by that, you know, freedom from my anxiety, my fear, the disempowering stories I told. And I was living what I'd always dreamed to be living. You know, I married the love of my life. I have a career that I adore. I'm touching lives. I'm making a difference. And then I get this diagnosis and it's like, this is not my time to go. You know, I'm going to survive this and I'm going to thrive on the other side. Now, when you're given that kind of a diagnosis, did I believe that? Absolutely. No, I'm terrified. I'm devastated. I'm being told, you know, by everyone around me and the way they're responding that this is the end, but I couldn't afford to live that story. So I had to become that person that would find a way to survive and find a way to thrive on the other side. What would she do? What decisions would she make? What would she believe about what's happening right now? What meaning would she give this? And all those steps, you know, and, and this is all in my book as well, is with any challenge that we're faced with, how do you want to show up for? Because if you tell the story that this is the end or this is the worst thing that ever happened, you're not going to be in a very empowered space to take it on and overcome it. But for me, like I knew I needed to become the person that believed that she would survive. And because of that, I showed up with an energy that had me looking for all possible solutions and doing everything in my power to find a way through it. Most importantly, disciplining my mind in every single moment to, you know, you know, in moments of deep suffering saying, okay, you know, you're focusing on how sick you are, how scared you are, how dire this is, that's not going to help you heal. So let's change the channel, change the channel to gratitude. What can I appreciate? My God, I have health insurance. I have a family that loves me. I have two amazing clinical trials that I'm on donors that are going to help give me life. Like in those moments where I would move to gratitude, it was a higher energy state. And from there, I made better decisions as far as what to focus on the meaning to give the moment and what to do about it. And it's a miracle that I'm here today. And I feel so deeply blessed. Every breath that I take feels like this beautiful gift. But the thing is, it's not just a beautiful gift to me. It's a beautiful gift. Your breath, this life for you is this precious gift. And we only have one of them. And the fact that I'm here today, all I want is to be able to help others find their freedom, to help others understand that they are in the driver's seat of their life. And if they're not happy, if they're not satisfied, let me show, let me show you the way to finding joy, to living your best life. Because each and every one of us can, but it starts with deciding that, yep, you know what? It's up to me. I always tell people when I hear people complain and I say, you know what the best thing about life is? And they're like, what? I said, life. Because if you don't have that, you ain't got nothing else. Nothing. You know? So what I mean, are you going to do with it? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you, when you're you're an ex this extreme athlete, perfect condition, and then you get to your point in in your life and this happens, this diagnosis happens, what what was that all about? You know, I mean, that's kind of like blindsides you, right? Absolutely. I mean, I took such great care of myself, you know, all through my time as a professional athlete. Beyond that, you know, just always ate well and did all the right things. So I'm a believer that when something really bad happens, we have to give it an empowering meaning. Like we just have to give it a meaning that moves us forward, not back. And so at the time I could only think, you know, there's a saying that went through my head, what I'm going through now is preparing me for what I asked for. And at the time, I'll never forget, you know, I'd found my freedom. I found joy. I found love. And I would go for a walk every morning. This is before I got diagnosed go for a walk with my dogs and I'd look around and I would just kind of like pray like I just want to find a way to touch lives and make a beautiful difference in this world because I feel so blessed to have found my way to 
everything that I've ever dreamed of. Then I get sick and I think, well, maybe, you know, going through this, this or finding a way to overcome it will, will lead me to becoming the person I need to become so that I can make that difference so that I can touch lives. So when I thought about it that way, like that actually gave me the sense of, okay, I just got to get through this because it's, it's helping me become the person I need to become to live the mission, the purpose that I have. You know, one of the first things I did in my healing process is I thought, you know, this is a disease, but we also create disease in our bodies, don't we? We create disease with our anxiety, with our fears, with our anger, with our resentment. And I wanted to release all disease from my body. That meant just like forgiving my father, like there were other people, you know, maybe you have a friendship that ended in a bad way and it left a bad taste in your mouth. Like all those things I was going to reconcile any relationships that, you know, were left in a, in a bad way. I was going to reconcile my, my fear, my anxieties. I was going to basically sweep out my soul to help make way for the healing to move through me. And so I think, you know, for all of us, it's a good rule of thumb to say, Anything that's left that causes you some pain that's kind of sitting inside of you and gives you a knot in your stomach, like deal with those things. Don't, don't leave it there. Don't leave it unattended. Um, cause I can only think that maybe those things, you know, created an imbalance in my body. Cause I just can't imagine why, why AML. I understand now because there were gifts. What's that? You meditate? You have any spiritual practices? What? What do you, what what every single morning? Yeah. So, and so deeply important. (laughs) you know, getting present. Um, Every morning I I do a gratitude practice where number one, the first thing I do when I open my eyes is think about something I'm grateful for. Think about most people wake up, I didn't get enough sleep. I've got such a big day. I don't have enough time to do the things. And it starts your day in the scarcity mindset and it ends up leading to, you know, not the best day. But if you start your day in an abundance mindset by opening your eyes and thinking about what you're grateful for, like even my God, I can see, I'm so grateful that I have two eyes that can see. But my gratitude practice is something Tony Robbins does. It's called priming. And it basically, you take 10 minutes or so to get present to things that you're deeply grateful for. Maybe it's a memory of your wedding or a memory of your child being born. And it's, it's like remembering it, thinking about it, using all your senses to experience it. You go from those, so three things that you're grateful for, and then you go into healing. You ask for healing, whatever you believe in, God, the universe, ask for healing anything that needs to be healed and see the golden, beautiful golden light moving through your body, healing anything that needs to be healed. Maybe it's your body. Maybe it's your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, and then asking to solve anything that needs to be solved. Maybe there's some big, you know, for me, it was help me find a way to, you know, beat this disease and then asking for strengthening. Please strengthen within me what is already so strong, my courage, my faith, my energy, whatever it is. And you feel that, that healing, the solutions coming through you, the strengthening, and then you send that out. You see the healing of, you know, maybe it's a family member that needs healing or a pet or or the world, and you see the healing moving through those people. And then the one of the most important parts that comes next is you think about three things that you want to achieve, accomplish, or experience, and you see it happening in your mind using all five senses. So for me, I'd be lying in my hospital bed and I would imagine myself running up my favorite mountain trail and I'd use all my senses. I would feel like the the warmth of the sun on my cheeks. I would feel the cool wind coming through my hair. I'd hear my wife encouraging me to the top. I'd smell the wildflowers. I'd see myself celebrating at the very top that I was cancer free. I get to live. I would see it so vividly. Every single day I would see the same vision. And every single day I did this practice and it just put me in a higher energy state so that I could 
I could better cope with what I was going through. And just a side note, you know, a year post bone marrow transplant, I ran that my favorite mountain trail and it was exactly as I had seen it in my mind day after day after day, the same warmth, the same wind. It was everything. So we can create this in our minds if we visualize what we want to experience, what we want to achieve and see it happening every single day. Our brain doesn't know if it's happening in real life or you're making it up in your mind. But I feel there's this manifestation that takes place where you're moving towards that. Prayer, so, so huge for me. My faith uh, was so important moving through this, has always been so important to me. And by faith, you know, that's up to you. What is that bigger something that, that you know has your back? For me, it's God, my God, the God that I believe in, whatever it is for you. But faith is so important. And prayers, even for example, you know, as, as I'm getting chemo and instead of thinking, oh my God, this poison's going into my arm. It's like, thank you. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for bringing me life. Thank you for taking me one step closer to overcoming this. So prayer and presence, um, you know, I think when we go through hard times, a couple of things can happen. We can totally either dwell on our pain and just it gets worse and worse and worse. Some people just push it under the rug and avoid how they're feeling. I think it's so important to kind of love yourself through those really difficult moments, love yourself through them, but then find a way to advocate for yourself to focus on something that can make you feel a little bit better, focusing on something that will help you keep moving forward no matter how small the steps are versus focusing on things that make you feel worse and they're taking you further away from everything you want. So these practices, it's it's all day. It's all day shifting your focus. It's all day choosing to feel better. I saw you talking about sen senses. You touched on senses there. Do you have any thoughts about that? Because I have a theory about young people, you know, with technology, you know, and you can see this play out in society. And I think speaking to what you're saying, it, it kind of goes with power, power of the mind. You know, if you take your mind and start, you know, from a positive point instead of going to a negative point, then you're you're better off to start with. But when you, you're talking about utilizing your senses to kind of revitalize your body, you know, what do you say to say young people may not be utilizing their senses the right way? Because I have a theory of when when you when you have a technology and it's a swipe left, swipe right, you know, thought process, there's no emotion mm -hmm. in that. And and they don't experience, you know, they have a hard time communicating with young people and so forth. And I think this is a big deal that nobody's really touching on with with the senses because you can see young people now, there's these things that may not be that big of an issue, but their reaction is so much bigger because they haven't experienced that emotion. Yes. Do you have oh, any thought I... processes about that, about the senses and feelings? and, and Absolutely. You know? I mean, you it's so important to match together feeling with, you know, even your favorite song, your favorite song that gives you energy and you want to go out for a run or knowing that there's a certain song that when you listen to it, it brings you down and understanding how you can control your emotions by what you're focusing on. And what you're focusing on involves using your senses, right? So it's so important. You know, we only make those connections when we're present. Well, that's not true. I mean, we make those connections, but it's much more powerful if we have an awareness when we're making that connection. Like, wow, you know, when I smell my mom's fresh baked bread, it brings up all these wonderful memories or something like that. You use something personal for you. So if I'm in a moment where I'm really struggling, how helpful would it be to think of my mom's bread or to smell bread somewhere and think about a wonderful moment that then lifts my energy a bit where I can then move out of this really dark space. But as you're saying, you know, with social media and, and actually on that topic with social media, I think that the hardest thing is, is that that what so many kids and teenagers and young adults are doing is they're witnessing these lives, you know, the highlight reel of all these people. And all they're seeing is how easy it looks for these people to have become uber successful. And that's where I think it is so incredibly important for people to be real and vulnerable and to share their authentic story so that people don't think that getting successful is this perfect road. And if you're not having this perfect road that, you know, 
you're never going to make it. That's what these kids think is that, well, my life's not that perfect. So I guess I'll never be successful. I'll never be happy like that. So I think, you know, using your senses, number one is the single most powerful way to move out of a bad space. I don't know if you see what I'm trying to say here, but to move you out of a space and thinking about what you want to feel, which requires you to have felt it at some point. We all have, we've all felt joy. So if we want to feel joy in a moment to somehow feel a little bit better, like think about one moment in time where you felt such joy. John, tell me about some moment in your life where you remember just feeling absolute joy. What was happening? I don't know. I think conversion of my creative career, you know, I think um, until you can take creative and convert that and support yourself, that's a big deal. And obviously the, the birth of my daughter was probably, I guess, number one. Now, if I really think about it, but um, you know, and you touched on something there is like with kids seeing, you know, living kind of a, an unknown life. And I, it's weird you said that. I mean, that's a whole different topic of uh, anticipation or ex, uh, expectations of what young people think they should get. They, they, they almost try to, it was just like I talked to this producer, Arthur Smith. He produced um, Hell's Kitchen uh, and he had, uh, has America's ninja show or whatever on the air now he's done a lot of stuff but you know thinking about that and 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 we're talking about mike darnell who buys shows a lot of shows for fox and talking about how him and mike were a little crazy you know and some of these kids try to make everything so perfect or they expect this should happen or this should happen and they're trying to make all these things perfect and they cut off their nose to spite their face when really the great ones are a little crazy and they're not perfect you know so that's that's another that's a whole nother topic there as well that I see that's linear in society in a way. One million percent. And you're hitting on something so important to me. And that is that, you know, life is not a straight line and nobody's perfect. And let's embrace that. Let's embrace our uniqueness. Let's embrace our failures, knowing that it's the only way we can succeed is if we fail along the way, right? Because if we're not failing, we're not learning. If we're not learning, we're not growing. If we're not growing, we're not going to be making progress and achieving success. So let's spread the word that, you know, if you're failing, you're on track. As long as you're learning and you're changing your approach, you're doing things differently after each time you fail, you're taking one step closer to what you want. And there's no such thing as perfection. So if you're seeing perfection, it's not real. And so I absolutely agree with you. And I think that, you know, the biggest success stories that you hear about, um, they were, you know, marred with failure, disappointments, you know, doubt, fear, all these things. It's in the overcoming that they ultimately succeed. So for kids to know that to kids, for kids to not expect perfection, because what happens then they expect it, they don't get it and they give up. They don't even try. And that's, the saddest thing that we could see happen. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty bad. I mean, and, and it speaks to, I mean, going back to your book here, finding a way you put this book out. What is your, what are your goals the next couple of years? What do you want to achieve from this point on? You have this new book out. You found a way you've, you've overcame a lot. You overcame a lifestyle. You became a great, uh, a, a world champion. You're the best in the world at what you did. Now you've overcome this um, leukemia, finding a way. Tell me, tell me what, what the goal is for Siri the next couple of years. So my goal and we, my wife and I run a, um, horse rescue. We save horses from slaughter for human consumption. And these horses are incredible healers. So we run a lot of um, equine assisted healing programs at our ranch nearly every weekend in the spring and summer. So my ultimate purpose is to help as many people as possible find their freedom, uh, help guide them to living the lives they want to live and finding the joy, the fulfillment that they're searching for and to help heal. You know, whether it's healing humans through horses or helping people find their own healing through this book, but continuing the work of really just bringing out the best in as many human beings and animals as I can, but also just being, you know, a person that brings love, light, kindness and inspiration into the world. If, if I can touch even one life, that's a life well lived. But I have been given this ultimate gift of, of surviving and living and thriving. And I want to use that to be a 
wonderful example, to be a guide, to be a support, and to be a love. Uh, one last question. What is your lineage, by the way? Where's your What's your lineage and where's your family from? Because I think so, there's a lot to that. Yeah, I agree. I was, um, my grandfather was 100% uh, Norwegian. So I'm part Norwegian on my dad's side, um, part British, uh, actually almost half British. So British, Norwegian, and American, a little bit of French in there. Um, so Nordics, but, you ever heard of the Nordics? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't course. know. That's the vibe. I, that's the vibe I got. I'm not going to, yeah. I won't get too deep into that. If we want to find the book, Finding a Way, where do we, where do we find the book? So I would love for your listeners to pre-order. It comes out on June 20th. If you pre-order today and even beyond that, but obviously if you pre-order today, it's going to show up in a lot more places once it releases. A dollar of every book is going to feeding America. And Tony Robbins is going to match that dollar. So $2 from every book sale will go to Feeding America. That feeds one family. He's close. I think he actually has fed a billion families in the last five years. So I hope to add to that. Um, but I would absolutely love you to purchase this book. Um, if you follow me on Instagram at Siri Lindley, or if you text, actually, this is a good one. If you text 66866, text go first to 66866, you will be signed in to not only win a free copy of the book, but a signed copy of the book, and you will get one free downloaded chapter. So do that today, but I would love for you to spread the word. I am more proud of this than I've been of anything in my life because I really know it's going to make a beautiful difference. So John, I thank you so much for, you know, having me come on today and to be able to speak about it. Um, you're helping me hopefully touch a lot of lives and I appreciate that so much. Well, I'm, I'm happy to have you on and it was a great conversation and hopefully everybody can learn something from this today. And this has been the survivor finding a way Siri Lindley, and I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Production.